name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry, uh, Duke fans. I don't know what to say. It's a good game, though. <laughs> so nothing, nothing we do and nothing that Jesus did is without historical context. If you go to the places today, they've changed, but the sense that they're real and that Jesus had a real life comes through. When you arrive in 21st century Jerusalem, you see a sparkling city, modern buildings, aluminum and glass, cranes everywhere. Streets are bustling. The city is expanding into the desert in three different directions. Modern streetcar heads down the long curving boulevard of Jaffa Street, street filled with pedestrians and it stops just before the old city of Jerusalem. And now, where you are, the surrounding neighborhoods are busy, but not affluent. Street vendors proliferate, and there's a crowded bus station. Ahead and to one side of the old city is the Mount of Olives, and as at the foot of the ridge leading away from the old city is the Jericho Road. It winds through older, less affluent neighborhoods that are crowded together. Cars are jammed at angles, parking wherever they can on its side. And it curves around. And then, as the ridge of the Mount of Olives comes to an end, the road suddenly stops. Across the road is a barren concrete wall 30 feet high, capped with barbed wire. Directly ahead of you, if you could see through the wall and up the next hill, is the village of Bethany. It's a short walk, but you can't get there anymore. To go to Bethany, you must leave by car from the other side of modern Jerusalem, take a tunnel through the Mount of Olives, pass through a militarized checkpoint, and drive for miles through the desert down a four-lane highway that links the new gated suburbs of Jerusalem that are perched on hills in the Palestinian West Bank. And finally, you come to a connecting road and traverse up to Bethany from the back. Nearly 20 centuries ago, Jesus walked from the old city of Jerusalem to the village of Bethany, to the house of his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus for dinner. Six days later, he was executed at the old city by Roman authorities. And as I reflected this week on that dinner in Bethlehem, in Bethany, three themes kept persisting in my mind, which helps, by the way, because you need three themes for a sermon, I think. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Not two, not four, three. The first theme was the continued reality of uncontrollable, inexplicable war and violence. The second was the whole question of Jesus' teaching about the poor. And the third was the absolute sustaining beauty of that Bethany moment. So I'd like to cover these three themes with you this morning, war, poverty, and the beauty of the Bethany moment first war. And the truth is, 
I went to sleep last night and I woke up this morning thinking of what's going on right now in the Ukraine. It's unspeakable and it's horrible. And I'm in constant prayer for those people and I have for an ending of the evil impulses of Vladimir Putin, but it is all so massive and out of control. And what I've realized this last month is that I've actually had the privilege of spending my life in a kind of refuge from war and violence. Born as the Second World War ended, Ukrainian conflict has a kind of a Second World War feel to many. And I've tried and failed to imagine what it would be like to be waking up every day for six years, as my parents did, to that reality and to either be engaged in the battle myself or to have family engaged in it. And I'm going to stop talking about this right now because each person here has his or her own relationship to war, many fully related to its trauma. So please forgive me for what memories I may have evoked, but we all have them. Now, the Roman Empire was not all that different from Russia under Vladimir Putin. I mean, we all think it was nice and constitutional, right? And they built pretty buildings like our state capitol. Following the designs of whoever was Caesar, Rome's soldiers marched into whatever country they chose. They killed both the soldiers sent against them and the members of the populace who got in the way. And Caesar's goal, like that of Babylon or Assyria or Alexander the Great before him, was to expand the power and wealth of his nation and to subjugate the surrounding nations and races. By the evening in Bethany that we're talking about, Rome had been in control of Palestine for nearly a century. The armed presence was constant, although somewhat stable, but underneath it was uncontestable, vicious power. It seems likely, if you read the New Testament, that Jesus saw the destruction of Jerusalem coming. 37 years after his death, tired of harassment by Jewish patriots, Rome's massive armies conquered Jerusalem and flattened it, killing everyone in their way. Jerusalem was like Mariupol. Now that's what Jesus could see that night. As he left the old city and he walked back along the road to Bethany, following the ridge of the Mount of Olives. And by the time Jesus would by the time Jerusalem was reduced to ashes, Jesus would be long gone, at least in the body. But the sense of uncontestable power and violence was always in the air. A one-man wooden cross would be like a matchstick to the Roman military machine. The horrible and explicable violence that afflicts humankind then and even today the dark shadow of impending war, that was the fear underlying Jerusalem. That was the monster that Jesus was to poke, virtually guaranteeing his own execution. And he brought that foreboding knowledge into the house at Bethany on the night we're describing. War, now poverty. It seems strange that one of the most lasting discussions coming out of that night in Bethany deals not with the violence of the Roman Empire, but with Jesus' teaching about poverty. Judas, apparently jealous at the love which Mary was showing Jesus, I don't agree with what John says. He says he just wanted the money. I think, I think, Jesus, I think Jesus was really jealous. <laughs> apparently jealous at the love which Mary was showing Jesus, left the dinner in a huff. But first, 
he dismissed Mary's profligate use of a valuable spice to anoint Jesus as an immoral act. The spice could have been sold for a lot of money, he proclaimed, and the money given to the poor. Jesus didn't let Judas' comment go without a response. The poor will always be with you, Jesus said. She's anointing me for my burial. Poor will always be with you. Sounds offhand. As a social teaching, it seems callous. I've really had it quoted to me a whole lot of times, let me tell you, and virtually always by somebody who was trying to justify economic or racial inequality. That person may well have given money to the poor, but what he or she did not do was to work for the full incorporation of the poor and rich together into the economy and life of the city. Ironically, I really think there are very few poor people who would agree with Judas. Because my experience is that people who don't have a lot of material wealth generally don't view it the same way as the well-off. A celebration, a time of hospitality, a funeral are genuinely special. Times to spend whatever you have for the sake of the joy and honor and meaning of the moment. Poor people really get that. And Mary knew what she was doing. But more to the long-term point, Jesus had always made his teaching about the poor very clear. And he lived what he taught. In his first teaching at the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said, because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, he said. Repent. So this wasn't the beginning of his conversation between Jesus and Judas. For Jesus, the existence of rich and poor was not something to be solved in a one-off violent revolution. Rather, he viewed it as the great human task and opportunity. The coming out together of people in a common fabric in which all are fed and all are satisfied. Remember the feeding of the 5,000. Once more, Jesus named to Judas the long arc toward equity and community, the agenda of human history as he understood it. That line about poverty has stuck with us over the centuries. The discussion about what Jesus meant has not. In any case, it was a seemingly incidental, but perhaps very important theme that night in Bethany. War and poverty were themes of that evening in Bethany, but they were the backdrop to the most important thing that was going on. The third and most important theme from that evening in Bethany was the vision of eternity. Now, there is no more sensuous passage in all of Christian and Hebrew scripture than this one. This is an X-rated sensuous passage. They gave a dinner for Jesus. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, wiped them with her hair. And time stood still. And it's this moment that we remember. The story has been told over and over again all over the world and for nearly 2,000 years. And we're telling it again this very morning at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia. We tell it for its meaning. We tell it for its beauty. We tell it for its quality. Time stood still. The quality of eternity itself 
was revealed in love and unselfconscious care. It happened, as such moments often do, in the shortness of time, under the threat of death. It was so powerful that whatever other agendas were present vanished completely, replaced by the aroma of the anointing and the self-giving of the sister. That dinner was what the poet T.S. Eliot calls a timeless moment. In such a moment, and we never know how long it lasts. We know that we ourselves are timeless, held in an aura of truth and beauty we cannot comprehend, that neither war nor poverty, nor death nor life, nor things present nor things to come can come between us and the love of God. That's the real story of the dinner at Bethany, and it's why we remember it.